The following program contains references to suicide. Is this a typical day for you? To, now is not a good time. Um, I'll talk to you at lunchtime. Just yeah. too busy to chat? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm running three rooms at the moment. It's frantic, so. What does that mean, not running great. three rooms? It means that Jackie's seeing, or well, Jackie's got a patient for me. So I'm seeing patients in three, three rooms. I think we're exhausted. I think we feel undervalued. I'm struggling for people to pick it in the first place. How am I going to get it off? Yeah. How are you going to get it off? I don't know. I honestly do not know. Australia's workers are burning out. We're in the grip of a national labour shortage. From hospitals to hotels, Thanks, from farms to the factory floor, this is a story of exhaustion and waste as well as toil and perseverance. And to tell it, we've come to a place that's crying out for help. We've reached breaking point. None of us have anything left. Your health group, we'll give you a call on that number. At this GP clinic in the New South Wales town of Griffith, the workday begins with an overheated switchboard. Good morning, your health group, is Carissa speaking. Your health group, this is Carly. She is, um, she is already booked out for today though. Your health group, Sarah speaking. No, I'm sorry, she's already booked out for today. No, I can put you on the waiting list for her today. Patients wait weeks to see a doctor here. But each morning the phones ring hot with people desperate to nab a cancelled appointment. We are extremely busy, okay. it's Monday. Okay, well, oh, this is the best that we can do for you, I'm sorry. What is your name? Look, I know it's difficult, but this is, we just don't have any appointments available today. Some patients turn up regardless. Morning. Morning, how are you? How are you? Not too bad, thanks. Hey guys, how are you Good, how are you? How can I help? Is Marion working today? She is fully booked today at this stage. Um, if you are able to call though, you will Dr. be able J. to... Dr J. Uh, Dr J isn't in today, I'm sorry, he doesn't work on Monday. Uh, how about you and me? No, sorry, she's left us, Oh, has she? Yeah. Yeah, right. I'm okay. sorry. Rightio. What to do now after a brain scan? Yeah. Interesting. This clinic is on the front line of a chronic and worsening national shortage of GPs. It's bad in major cities, but in regional and remote areas, the situation is desperate. The latest figures show more than 2,000 GP vacancies across Australia. Dr Thevashanga Vasuthevan juggles patients in person and over the phone. We are struggling, really struggling. How many doctors is this clinic short? How many extra doctors could I it do? I think we need at this stage, we need at least uh, three to four full-time doctors to manage our patients. And that across and a week, there's 500 yeah. patients, just this clinic can't see. Yep, yep. That's and if you see my table, it's one of the messiest tables you ever see. Uh, these are all requests. You wear the burden of the uh, GP shortage, the GPs who remain. Yes, yes, correct. Mm. So we, uh, yeah, so the people who are working, say, for example, for my, my personal circumstances, I have not taken a holiday for the last two, three years. 
uh, I mean, I have a family situation where I ha I'm from Sri Lanka. Yeah. So I had to go back to see my mom who is uh, not well. But I need to find a time to go. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes you feel like you're, you're a useless son. In the 15 years Dr Theva has worked in Griffith, he has never seen the GP shortage this bad. How are you going, James? Very good, thank you, Dr Theva. Thank you. And yourself? I'm OK. <laughs> good, I'm good, good, thank you. Yeah, Sorry. just a just usual Monday. So we will start doing a procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Dr Theva and I have a thing about joining the dots, don't we? I come in a bit every three months and he cuts something off. Good way to lose weight though, isn't it? That is. <laughs> You're not taking your warfarin today? No, not last night. You spent a bit of time in the sun as a young man, James? I was born and raised in Hay. Small country towns. What would we do with our doctors and nurses? Mm. Dr. Marion Reeves is the longest serving GP in the practice. Are you able to give the patients the time that you need to give them? Um, we give them the time that we need, but I would like to give them more time to be able to, um, you know, do a little bit of preventative health. And how's the um, stress weighing on you of having to rush through? Uh, the day I'm not rushing. Is... No, I don't rush. Just do one at a time. You've got to, you've got to be able to, you know, um, just see one person at a time. But it means that it's, it's not, um, you know. It's, it's a busy morning, yeah. Just, just but experience efficient. helps, experience helps. Yeah, that's right. You've got to be efficient, absolutely. And now I'm going to run over the top of you because I need to be in another place. Ignore us. <laughs> yeah, ignore you. Yeah, righto. Oh, Jackie, that's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. We're good? Come on through. Do you want me to get the scales to get a weight for? No. He's going to be nine Dr. Reeves sacrifices her lunch break to speak to me. How long's your waiting list? About nine weeks at the moment. Yeah. It, does that does is that is that feasible? I mean, if you if you're sick, you can't wait nine weeks to see a doctor. That's right. It's it's not feasible. No. So we all try to keep a couple of reserve appointments each day, um, but that's only two or three. And as you probably have seen with the cancellation lists, I would have twenty or thirty people on a cancellation list most days, wanting an appointment. I don't think things get missed, but things get overlooked. So patients that have got um, problems with their diabetes don't get in and, and don't get seen. They don't know that their sugars are up. Um, so there are treatment things that should be happening for patients that we can't do. Staff here are at their limit. 22-year-old receptionist Megan is still shaken from a confrontation with a patient unhappy with the delay for an appointment. I asked him multiple times to not speak to me like that. Yeah. Please leave. Oh, Megan, I'm sorry you've got to put up with the crap. It's no. terrible. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, if you see him walk in the front door, oh. just walk out the back. Oh, I will. Yeah. That's not an uncommon occurrence for me to have one of the girls in my room crying. Um, and it's heartbreaking because it is actually... They are doing their job. You know, they're providing a service to the community. Do you think that this is because of staff shortages or becoming more common because of staff shortages? Oh, it's definitely... It's the impact of not having enough GPs on the floor, definitely. Staff, that... that it's just a, a big roll-on effect, you know. It affects us all. The stress and workload in clinics like this across Australia is clearly taking a toll. Less than 14% of medical graduates are now choosing general practice compared with 40% 30 years ago. But a stopgap solution, bringing in overseas trained GPs, is expensive and slow. There are 319 GPs still waiting for their visa applications to be finalised. One has accepted a job in Griffith, but it will have taken him eight months to see his first patient here. It's all taking three or four times longer um, to get these people in and they're, they're keen to come. They've got their families organised to move 
to a new country, we really don't want anything standing in their way. It's a huge weekend in Griffith. Every room in town is booked out for a celebration of the area's heritage. Italian migrants helped transform this part of New South Wales into an agricultural heartland. Griffith's got so much opportunity. It's been born on vision, been born on entrepreneurship, and that continues today. Decades of hard work to build up this region is being undermined by a dire shortage of workers. We're missing out on some of those essential things uh, like health, like education, absolutely spot on. But further to that, we're missing out on the opportunity to grow. We've got plenty, as you say, it's boom times here at the moment. We've got plenty of water coming down the river. If we can get that in here, we can grow crops to feed not only New South Wales and Australia, but we export over one and a half billion dollars worth of crops out of Griffith annually. So that export dollar could grow if we could get more people into town. minutes drive outside of Griffith are the vast Super Seasons citrus orchards. changing the older plant, putting a new one in. So the boys will be removing all the older plants while we put in the new one. In the past, the half a million trees here would be picked by around 200 workers. The majority of them backpackers. Today, they're tended by just 20 people, mostly from Fiji. We need more people. There's a lot of work to be done. We need pruning to be done. We, need, we have machineries. We need operators. We need pickers. And you're running behind, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm running behind them. So many things. You can see that the grass is out. You can see that we need drainage done. So many things need to be done. I don't have people. Do more people want to come over? Exactly, more people are willing to come. The orchard has been allocated only 20 workers so far as part of a Pacific labour scheme that has brought in more than 27,000 people. Tristan! Peter Ciccato has managed these orchards for eight years. This is the second season in a row he hasn't been able to harvest the fruit. So you've got 20 workers, you need 200. Why can't you just get locals? There are none, full stop. We've had three businesses close in the last six months purely because they cannot get anyone, anyone, yet alone a local. Not even if you bumped up the wages to, what are, what are these guys are earning 29 bucks an hour. What if you offered $40 an hour? During COVID, we actually uh, did offer forty-five dollars an hour and got zero, right. zero people. It's 
So, Adam, this is this is a prime example of what I wanted to show you. Um, this is a direct result of not having labour at the right time to pick it. So you can see. That's astonishing. All the fruit that's there and all the fruit that's still got to come off. And there's nothing wrong with any of this, is there's it? Like... Absolutely nothing wrong with it. The only trouble now is that it's gone past its point and uh, it can break down in between here and getting it onto the shelf. Right. It's just overripe, basically. Right. right. Peter Ciccato finds it hard to walk these rows. It's heartbreaking that, you know, you have to get up in the morning, you have to face the orchard each day and you see all this fruit on the ground, all this fruit on the tree and you think, why am I doing this? To what end? This problem colours every waking hour and a good part of his nights too. It gets worse each day um, as we see more and more fruit that drops down. Uh, it, it definitely leads... Uh, I find it difficult to get up in the mornings. Uh, I find it very difficult to sleep at night because you're constantly thinking of what can I do? How, how can I try and resolve this issue? not only for this year, but for next year. Uh, and you start spiralling downwards into depression. a sense of how pervasive the worker shortage is, all you need to do is take a drive down the main street of Griffith. The pharmacist over there needs four more staff. This florist needs two more workers. The cafe across the road needs a cook and two front of house staff. The Gem Hotel could do with 30 more workers. The area hotel needs 15 people. The local McDonald's franchisee is looking for 50 workers across two sites. But the scale of the problem really becomes apparent as you head a little bit out of town. Griffith's biggest employer, Bayada Poultry, needs another 200 people. Businesses that rely on skilled trades have come to depend on foreign workers. Collier and Miller Engineering is the sort of business that politicians like to visit during election campaigns, to bask in the glow of Australian innovation and manufacturing. But this company could be doing so much more. It's screaming for workers. This is an earth mover laser bucket. Um, what, what they use it for is, what farmers use it for is to reshape the, the, the lay of the land right. um, so that water runs off at the, at the right grade. Critical piece of equipment in the Riverina. Yeah, critical for, for all the irrigation systems around here. Yeah. yeah. And is this an example of something that you can't build as quickly as you want to? Yeah, it's it's. I've got guys that um, that, that ring up. They, they might have won a contract. They want to buy one within three months. I, I can't supply it for twelve months. We've short about twenty-five staff. Uh, we run a crew of ninety staff, but short twenty-five at the moment. And how are you trying to fill that fill that gap? Well, we, we're constantly advertising. We try to put on apprentices and we also um, bring in foreign workers. Are you able to find apprentices here in Australia? 
Um, it's difficult. It's, um, we, we do manage to put on about eight a year. Uh, we'd probably like to put on more than that, but um, some years we don't even get eight applicants. Paul Giovanazzo says foreign workers are now the backbone of the business. But the problem is visa processing times, which have blown out from three months to at least nine. What would it mean for your business if you could get those extra workers? Um, if, if we get our lead times back to, say, 10 weeks, we could probably double, double the amount of output and double our turnover in, in, in gross terms. Double? Double, easily double. Four Corners can reveal the scale of the visa problem nationally. There are 10,700 people still waiting to get their temporary skill shortage visas approved. And almost 60,000 people are in line for permanent skilled visas. But most of these visas aren't even for workers. More than half are for their family members. It's not just the first day of spring, it's also the first day of the Jobs and Skills Summit. I'm going to spring him a step. Yes, that's a dad joke. <laughs> As one of his first orders of business, the new Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, convened a Jobs Summit, in part to address the labour shortage. The Prime Minister came prepared. Hey, thanks, Nige. How are you today? The government announced a $1.1 billion boost to vocational training. To create an additional 180,000 fee-free take places for 2023. The number of newly qualified tradespeople entering the workforce has plummeted around 30% in the last 10 years. It's made it incredibly hard for employers to find local applicants, including chefs. I multi-skilled all my staff, so one of my cleaners went into the kitchen and learned how to do a certain part of the kitchen. And the uh, head chef I had, um, she was doing seven days a week. And then I was doing a couple of days, and then we trained our cleaner to do a couple of quarter days so our chef could get a couple of days off. How is your cleaner as a chef? She's great. She does a good palmy. <laughs> the federal government says it will prioritise repairing Australia's broken visa processing system. Look, when we arrived in office at the end of May, um, I was genuinely staggered by what I saw. Uh, it was a system that was completely clogged up, um, understaffed, completely focused on, um, you know, bureaucracy and filling out forms. And we've been working really hard since then to try to make a big change to the visa processing system of the department because it just doesn't reflect um, how important this is for Australia's future. We know some of the short term... Labor has increased the number of permanent visas for workers and their families by 35,000 each year and announced it will try to recruit 500 workers to help with processing. The skilled visa backlog has been significantly reduced since the new government took office. Your department has sent us the statistics of how you're going. You are making some progress, but you're barely chipping away at the temporary skill pile because of the number of new applicants. And you're actually going a little bit backwards in the permanent visa pile. How on earth are you going to get on top of it? So we've lifted the staffing numbers right back up, not just to where they were in a normal operating environment pre-COVID, but actually lifted them up significantly in an attempt to get those processing times down. So you guys working on uh, irrigation towers? Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's just, continue that. Yeah. Yeah, just continue that work for the day. Just before the election, the coalition cut nearly $900 million from the migration budget. Yeah. Are you actually reversing that cut or shifting money around? 
a little bit of both. So we are uh, we are, have moved resourcing within Home Affairs to make sure that we are properly um, putting resources into the visa processing area of the department. But in addition to that, we've committed significant additional resources into visa processing. So, you know, the human end of this is people have uh, got fruit rotting on trees and things aren't showing up on supermarket shelves and we've got nurses working double and triple shifts to help those people. We need to speed up processing times and that's what we're doing. But you could reverse the cut. Why not just do that? Well, what we're trying to do is make sure that visa processing gets back on track and that is what we're doing. This crisis is affecting this generation of workers and the next. There is a serious teacher shortage at Murrumbidgee Regional High School. This is a typical day in a typical Australian high school. But we've been told that today, 40 staff are absent. Some are sick, some are on leave, and some are on secondment. But in a school that was short staffed to begin with, this is a big problem for the exhausted staff and the small pool of casuals who must fill the gaps. Susan Fauna teaches special ed and English at the high school. She's speaking as a representative of the Teachers' Federation. What we're dealing with here is a huge number of people that are in the system at the moment teaching that are struggling. They're, we're exhausted, we're burnt out. You know, I, I know of a young teacher that's leaving. Well, several that want to leave. Um, it, I just think, you know, a whole generation of kids and a whole generation of their teachers uh, are not getting what they need. And, you know, that to me is devastating. The impact of the teacher shortage is profound. In just the first four months of this school year, 222 classes at the school were merged and there were 416 instances of minimal supervision. This is happening in schools around the country. At any one time there could be classes that are collapsed or merged with other classes um, and, or sometimes uncovered. And some of the classes that are uncovered are sort of senior classes, so the kids are old enough to be, you know, safe. Um, and, but they're not getting that instruction. So I, I worry that that's going to affect their, um, their understanding when they, if they choose to go to university or if they choose to go on to tertiary education, that if they've chosen that particular subject area, that that might be limiting in that way, yeah. So what happens in a merged class of 60 students? Well, just give me an example of, of what it might look like and what, what a teacher is able to achieve. Mm, so probably it would be um, kids learning independently so, and the teacher would be monitoring. What concerns do you have about that? That's not good enough. It's not good enough for, for my town. You know, it's not good enough for any town in Australia. It's estimated that there's a shortage of around 4,000 teachers nationally. In the worst state, New South Wales, that number is predicted to be more than 10,000 within a decade. I think we feel undervalued. And it's frustrating because this was identified um, 10 years ago as becoming a problem, you know. And I think the policy makers have just sat on their hands. Hello, how are you? Are you ready to come and play today? Across Australia, childcare centres are advertising for 6,800 workers. Oh, what are you making? I'm making a cookie. Oh, a cookie, that's a great idea. I made a square one and you made a round one. Yeah. There are three Good Start centres in Griffith, each with between 100 and 150 children on the waiting list. Just one more teacher here would bring an outsized benefit to Griffith because it would free up so many parents to work. 
If we could recruit an early childhood teacher at our other centre, it would open up about 85 new positions at the service, so we could have an extra 85 attendances at the centre. It's been impossible to fill a key vacancy. One of our centres has been trying to recruit an early childhood teacher for about 420 days um, now. So, yeah, we've had people who have been studying towards in that time, but um, they too have either relocated or changed their mind and decided not to continue their studies. So, um, yeah, that position's been vacant for about 420 days. And the fact that you know the exact number of days <laughs> is a sign of how desperately needed that teacher is. Yes. Um, and it's not only for Griffith, it's, it's everywhere. Um, we just struggle to recruit. Australia animals. The award wage for a fully qualified early childhood educator is $26.42 an hour. That's less than you'd earn picking fruit. A bird. The workforce conditions, um, the pay parity, the recognition of early childhood um, education and care um, staff teams. We also have a burnout. So obviously working through COVID um, has put a lot of stress on people. Not being able to attract staff to the profession has actually placed more stress on the people who are here. Um, and we have people who are actually leaving sector. Of all the workplaces in town hit by the labour shortage, the stakes are highest for Griffiths Hospital. It's missing 43 staff out of 490. Dr Marlene Bothma is scrambling to keep up with demand. Very excited for this her waiting list has blown out to three months for patients with ongoing problems. Does that mean those chronic problems get worse if you're unable to see someone for a couple yes, of months? Yes, of course, because, you know, the patient might think it's a minor problem and something that isn't so urgent, um, but on the long run it could turn out to be something like a cancer or something that really needs more urgent treatment, but they, know, they don't know that that's the problem um, until they see the doctor. So we don't know what's out there until we see the patient. So are you missing things like cancers because of the waiting list? I think we definitely are. I think there's a delayed, um, delayed diagnosis. Um, we have seen that worldwide, really, that lots of our more serious chronic conditions are missed um, because of these delays that have been happening over COVID. So that's, that's really concerning. That really weighs heavily on me to think that there might be patients that need me, but I'm just one person. There's only so many hours in the day and I just can't get to everyone, which is tough. Most of the wards are short-staffed. So we need to find someone to be in charge this afternoon. As they battle to plug the gaps in the roster, the nurses must make room for new patients. She's getting quite upset that she has to go home today. So I'll give them a call and get them to come and see her straight away. We've got lots of vacancies in ICU, so that we've been working short staff for about two years now, and we can't fill those vacancies, so that's the problem for our department, so that's a little bit different in, than some of the other places. So the nurses are doing heaps of overtime, they're pushed every day, we can't finish caring for our patients, we can't get done in a nice way for the patient. As nurse unit managers, it falls on Christy Wilson and Julie Henderson to solve the daily staffing problems. Today, they are speaking as representatives of the Nurses and Midwives Association. The general public aren't aware of what's happening inside because they come into hospital, there's a nurse there, the nurse looks after them. They've got no idea that Julie, for instance, might have just worked 16 hours and she might be going home to have five hours sleep and coming back. Are you both involved in efforts to try and get nurses in from overseas? Yes, we've got several staff on their way from mainly the UK at the moment, but that's sort of six months, eight months in the making and they're still not here. The visa system needs to be tightened up and shortened dramatically because most of it's once we get our work done and, and the health stuff gets done, it's the visa that takes ages. 
At the end of August, there were almost 3,000 visa applications for registered nurses waiting to be finalised. I've got lots of health professionals around me um, and they tell me that, you know, they've been basically running on fumes for two years now and they're at the point where they just can't continue to do it anymore. And that's why we're trying to do all these things to try to bring more health workers into the country. They can't come soon enough. Julie Henderson says her ICU ward is short 10 full-time staff. It's not uncommon to go home exhausted and in the middle of the night wake up and go, oh, didn't do that, didn't do that. Oh, I hope somebody realised that hasn't been done yet. It's just an awful feeling, awful feeling. Is it dangerous for the patients in the system at the moment? Yes, it is. I mean, it's a well-known saying. It's working short-staffed is like drunk driving. You can get away with it nine times out of ten, but then something terrible is going to happen. So things do go wrong. To what extent is it driving young people out of the profession, do you think? Speaking to my colleagues in cities, uh, a lot of the staff, that, a lot of their junior nurses that are coming out and doing a little bit of time in the workforce, feeling unsupported and unsafe, they're just going back to uni and retraining in another profession. Paediatric nurse Stephanie Bell has just finished her shift. She, too, is speaking to us as a representative of the Nurses and Midwives Association. Hi, Stephanie. It's the end of a long week for you. Yes, very long week. Day six today. You must be looking forward to a break. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's exhausted across the board when you're working 50, 60 hour weeks, um, 18 hour shifts, even a 12 hour shift, you know. So even if, however bad things are now, they're, they're going to get worse because we have reached the point, we've reached breaking point. There's, none of us have anything left. But despite her exhaustion, her primary concern is for the patients. It's almost like playing Russian roulette. Some days are always going to be better than others but people shouldn't have to hope that the day they go to hospital is going to be one of the good days. They should expect that every day is going to be a good day. chilly Griffith morning, the town has gathered to hear the Prime Minister and New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet address regional concerns. Teacher Susan Fauna is here. What do we want? Time to teach! When do we want it? Now! And so are nurses Christy Wilson and Stephanie Bell. We would like to offer Dominic the opportunity to give a shift. 50 hour weeks and 18 hour shifts are not safe and they are not sustainable. We are all burning out and soon there will be none left. Inside, the PM couldn't escape questions about fast tracking foreign workers into the town. We well, need more people working in the system for a start. You can't have a visa. Uh, you know, granted without someone having a look at it. But the truth is that the gutting of the public service has consequences. I mean, it is absurd that people, some people have been waiting 12, 18 months to come to Australia who have skills uh, that Australia needs. But the other thing that... Local I'm state saying, MP Helen Dalton was looking for concrete answers to the problems in her electorate like a chronic housing shortage that's discouraging people from moving to Griffith. She wants more land released for housing and portable homes provided to doctors and nurses. We've got the jobs here, but we just haven't got the homes to put them in. 
we're really in a lot of trouble here at the moment. And it's right across the state, but I think here in Griffith it's the eye of the storm. And did you hear anything today that's going to fix any of those problems? No, I did not. I was, I was waiting for an announcement. I think, uh, you know, they were all in here. The, the, the Prime Minister and the Premier's been here and a lot of other MPs. Um, you know, I, I think there was an opportunity lost. In Griffith, the worker shortage can be measured in many different ways. Like hours worked, lessons missed, fruit on the ground and long delays. These costs repeat and reverberate across the nation. But what's almost impossible to measure is the accompanying fatigue and worry enduring distress felt by those who have been pushed to their limit. I don't know uh, what the future looks like, whether it's with me or without me, or what I'm going to do next. Uh, it's just very difficult to get up in the mornings and, and, and see this happening and knowing that Again, knowing that it can be resolved, we just need um, a better system. What do you mean, with, with you or without you? Uh, suicide is an option, Adam, it really is. I do know of people in our industry that have already committed that, that act, that have, because of a direct result, because I've not been able to get labour. And what do you do to look after your mental health? Uh, spend a lot of time with my family, a lot of discussions. Uh, not being fearful of, of what, you know, I'm actually telling you this, not uh, uh, being scared of seeking help. For myself, you know, in my, in my, at my stage of my career, I feel like I've got a lot to offer and I've, I, I like to be in the classroom, I like to be with the kids, that's where I get my identity from. But I, I, I'm just running out of puff. I just don't know how long I can do that for. And, you know, when you have day after day after day of that, it becomes really wearing and, and you just think, mm, you know, is this, is this it? Is this... Is this what I've got? Since we filmed in Griffith last month, two classroom teachers have resigned from the high school. Four admin staff have quit the GP clinic, all citing workload and stress. And three nurses and a midwife have left the hospital. And how often are you close to tears? Depends on the day, depends on the week. Um, I mean, it's not just me, like, you know, I've, you know, I found my colleagues crying in the, in the treatment room or in the storeroom and, you know, you meet up with your friends after work and, you know, they're on the verge of a breakdown as well and it's almost, yeah, you, you see it, even if it's not you on that day, there's someone and you can see it on their faces. If this program has raised concerns for you, you can contact one of these services.